the deletion of adverse data is so obviously not a legitimate statistical uh, method that it scarcely bears comment. Penn State did not interview any critics or targets, take any submissions, or provide any statistical references. Despite the mute testimony of the emails themselves, Penn State decided that there wasn't even prima facie evidence to proceed to an investigation on most issues, even once where the UK Information Commissioner had said it was hard to imagine more cogent prima facie, prima facie evidence. The UK Parliamentary Inquiry was next to report. They took submissions and had a brief hearing to which I wasn't invited. Um, I made a submission that made specific reference to the trick, but my analysis wasn't considered. Uh, the hearing was covered by parliamentary reporters and not just science reporters. Many of the reporters were taken aback by Jones's testimony, expressing their discomfiture in stylish English prose. Uh, Quentin Letts of the Daily Mail, for example, described Vice Chancellor Acton as, quote, a younger version of Professor Calculus from the Tintin books, who beamed and nodded at everything <laughs> Professor Jones said. I think that answer was spot on, he cried after listening to one response from the terror-stricken Jones. Dismayed by Jones' testimony, Letts hoped that the politicians sought second, third, and even 20th opinions. Other parliamentary uh, correspondents were equally acidic. However, in a three-to-one decision, the parliamentary uh, committee included once again that the trick was simply, quote, shorthand for the practice of discarding data known to be erroneous <laughs> in order to trick you into not knowing about the decline. <laughs> this finding was entirely, the, the, the finding that the data was known to be erroneous was entirely unsupported by the evidence. If tree rings had, for example, been measured incorrectly, then such data could have been discarded as erroneous. But that's not what happened. No one, not even the University of East Anglia, even hinted that the tree ring data had been measured incorrectly. The problem was different. The trees just didn't do what Biffa anticipated. <laughs> the committee's finding was totally unjustified. Now, in fairness, the parliamentary committee expressed its expectation that the science panel, the next inquiry, would weigh in on this matter, an expectation in which they were immediately disappointed. The science appraisal panel was led by Lord Oxford, the chairman of a large English wind utility. The, <laughs> the panel was announced on March 22nd and reported on April 12th. Its report was only five pages long. They did not interview any critics or climate gate targets nor did they take any submissions. Even its terms of reference remain unclear. The report stated that they were charged with assess, ass, assessing 11 essential papers that had been chosen on the advice of the Royal Society. However, the Royal Society has refused to answer any questions as to who at the Royal Society supposedly selected these 11 articles and why they were chosen. If they were trying to put questions to rest, the articles were singularly ill-chosen. The three Briffa articles in, that were considered were the first three articles, all of which preceded the trick and all of, none of which were in dispute. None of CRU's proxy reconstructions were studied. In fact, it seems that the 11 articles were selected not by the Royal Society but by the university. They proved to be the articles cited in the university's brief to the parliamentary committee, a submission that in which the university was trying to put CRU in the best possible light by citing the articles in which the trick had not been used, not the ones where it had been used. Lame as their report is, they did contradict the claim that the trick was a good way of handling data. Instead, they said that the IPCC uh, neglect to present the uh, deleted data was regrettable. So it wasn't a good way of dealing with the data after all. Of course, the IPCC authors in question had not neglected to present the data. They had done so intentionally. And of course, the IPC authors in question could hardly be separated from CRU and ClimateGate. They were Griffa, Jones, and Mann. But the Oxburg inquiry left all that out, its own version of the trick, I guess. <laughs> there is still one inquiry to go, the Muir-Russell inquiry, whose report is expected next month. 
It took submissions in a brief two-week window in February, but like the others, hasn't talked to any CRU targets or critics. Incidentally, it isn't the trick, just the trick that the inquiries have failed to investigate. To an astonishing degree, they've totally avoided dealing with any, any issues that have been raised by critics. This was recently recognized by the 14 authors of the Hartwell paper, including Mike Hume of the University of East Anglia, which stated, quote, hitherto none of the specific critiques of this work by those auditing it have been adjudicated by reviews of the, uh, reviewers of the matter and indeed were explicitly not investigated by the Oxford Review. The seeming obtuseness of these inquiries is obviously very frustrating. There, uh, as there just doesn't seem to be accountability anywhere in the system. For the public, non-disclosure of adverse data, like the trick, seems like misconduct. But Pielke Jr., for example, has observed that there's little point trying to fit non-disclosure of adverse data into academic misconduct complaints because the practice is so widespread in the academic community, not in, just in climate science, that it is easy to uh, provide supporting witnesses. And academics seem unoffended by the trick. But there's a price for not being offended because the public expects more. If climate scientists are unoffended by the failure to disclose adverse data, unoffended by the trick, and not committed to principles of full, true, and plain disclosure, the public will inevitably react as it has by placing less reliance on pronouncements from the entire field, diminishing the coin of scientists who were never involved, as well as those who were. This is not a happy situation at a time when climate scientists are trying to influence policy, and has caused many of them to lash back, blaming everyone but themselves and these tainted exonerations by these ineffective inquiries serve as an extra pretext for doing so. To the extent that the things like the trick were sharp practice, the practices need to be disavowed. The scientists do not need to be drummed out, but there needs to be some commitment to avoiding these sorts of sharp practice in the future. George Monbiot suggested early on that apologies were necessary on the part of climate scientists involved both to the targets and to the wider community, something that, in my opinion, would go a long way to achieving some sort of truth and reconciliation in a difficult situation. However, right now, this seems less likely to happen than ever. Despite the failures of the inquiries to do their job, I strongly uh, disagree with Cuccinelli's recent investigation of potential financial abuse. Regardless of what one may think of the quality of man's work, he's published diligently. In my opinion, Cuccinelli's actions are an abuse of administrative prerogative that on the one hand is unfair to man, and on the other hand provides an easy out for people to avoid dealing with real issues. I started my comments with caveats and I'll close with some more. The critical scientific issue as it has been for the past 30 years is climate sensitivity and whether cloud and water cycle feedbacks are strongly positive or weakly negative or somewhere in between. Uh, this is a territory of Lindzen, Spencer, Kinnanmouth, and Palpridge at this conference, and I urge you to listen to what they have to say. But also keep an open mind because many serious scientists do not agree with them and stand behind standard estimates of climate sensitivity to doubled CO2 in perfectly good faith. If the impact of doubled CO2 is relatively small, it would be through sheer good luck rather than good management. I don't subscribe to the view that we need perfect certainty to make decisions. On the contrary, businessmen and politicians make decisions all the time under unquantifiable uncertainty. And I, for one, unlike you know, many of the sponsors here, have no philosophical objections to governments making decisions on climate policy. I also think that there may be uh, important practical situations where people who are primarily worried about energy future can find common ground with people who are worried about climate. If I were a politician, regardless of what I felt personally, I would also take scientific guidance from official institutions rather than what I might think personally, either as an occasional contributor to academic journals or as a blogger. Although knowing what I know now, I would try as hard as I possibly could to improve the performance and accountability of these institutions. 
On the hockey stick, people sometimes say to me, if the hockey stick was wrong, then the situation is much worse than we think, arguing this on the basis that this would be evidence of greater climate sen sensitivity. My standard answer is, well, if that's the case, we should find out and govern ourselves accordingly and give no thanks to people whose obstruction has delayed the resolution of the, uh, the problem. Thank you very much. Steve points out that he got a standing ovation before he spoke, and uh... <laughs> all right, we are going to enter a Q&A session.